Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. A hundred years ago, we thought the universe was really a big place. But we were wrong. As it turns out, what we thought was the universe was but a single galaxy called the Milky Way. Since then, we've discovered billions upon billions of galaxies. And now we know with certainty that the universe is really, really, really a whole lot bigger than anything we could have previously conceived of. And even now that we know the scope and the scale of the thing, it boggles our ability to comprehend it. 76 trillion stars in the known universe at present, and by some estimates, even this number falls far short of the full accounting. The basis of human comprehension in earthbound terms, it uh, makes it hard for us to conceive the scale in terms of things without comparison. A dolphin is big when compared to a mouse. A planet is big when compared to a computer. Our solar system is quite massive when compared to a grain of sand. And 76 trillion solar systems in the known universe makes our solar system but one grain of sand compared to all the other grains of sand from all the beaches on planet Earth put together. Or 10 trillion stars for every human being alive today, or a mere 700 billion stars for every human that has ever lived on planet Earth throughout history. And while the day-to-day -day push and pull of our earthly days plays out under but one sun, we can see far beyond our own terms of existence now, and in doing so, have unlocked a point of perspective in our thinking that is truly beyond compare. The star stuff that we are made of is everywhere, and everywhere is big, even when it's all in your head here on This Week in Science, coming up next. to you kirsten good science to you too justin oh it's a time for another show we did it we made another week Woohoo! we're here we get to talk about science again it always makes me very excited do you get excited i i still do even after all of these years even after <laughs> i know i know even it's after great. all these thousands of years that science has been going on it still <laughs> finds ways to interest me Yes. Maybe because you haven't been actually reading it for thousands of years. I don't know. There's just a lot of a lot to learn out there. <gasps> so much, so much to learn, so much to do. And geez, we've got a jam-packed show ahead. I found a bunch of stories, at least, that I'm excited about. <laughs> I have found a bunch of your stories to be very exciting. Oh, excellent. Excellent. I'm very excited. <gasps> This is the show where Kirsten is excited and uh, we talk about science. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> on today's show, I brought stories about some tame bonobos, bonobo, bonobo taming, some social psychology, making use of MRI machines, and neutrons, Neuton neutrons that Ooh. like to trip. Trippy not neutrons. Neutrinos. Not neutrinos. Neutrons. But trippy neutrons. And Blair. Oh, what, oh, what do you got, Blair? Blair's bringing stories. Yeah, Blair I brought something about bower birds today. Nice. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Justin, what did you bring? I've got an amazing uh, Trojan horse slash zombie story. And uh, what is this one? And then... Uh, Oh, a very cool invention by scientists that's going to revolutionize some stuff. And uh, more stories on top of that that will be being discovered. Discoveries that will be made while we're doing the show. While we're doing the show. While we're doing the show. Yes. I've, got my, uh, I've got my machine here. It's, uh, it's ready to print out the absolute latest up-to-the-minute discoveries by science. So if anything gets discovered or anything happens big in science while we're on the air... It'll print out of that machine right there. Nice. I like it. It's like a ticker tape science machine. It, it is. Exactly. 
<laughs> but larger font, because the ticker tape was very, very small. It was very small. It was very, very small. All right, everybody. Uh, should we start with neutrons? How about some trippy neutrons? Do neutrons trip the light fantastic? Can they? Can they escape into another universe altogether? Huh? That's my question to you. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. There is an idea afoot in the physics, theoretical physics world, that neutrons might jump between universes and... We may have already done experiments, if not have the ability to do experiments very soon that would prove or disprove this universe jumping, proposed universe jumping ability of neutrons. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, from this theoretical idea, we can base, we, we can potentially discover in a very short, like, in in 2012, maybe, if someone does the experiment, we could find out whether or not there are multiple universes by watching neutrons. Mm. What? This is a little bit crazy. It makes my makes my brain a little crooked. But anyway, uh, researchers Michael Sarazen at the University of Namur in Belgium and his colleagues say that our galaxy might actually produce a magnetic potential that's large enough to allow matter to leap from universe to universe. Uh, uh, and the universes that we're talking about are called brain worlds by cosmologists. Um, could we actually show that this is possibly happening? And there. Uh, what they suggest in archive.org is that there are experiments at the Institute Lau Langevin in Grenoble, France, and St. Petersburg Institute of Nuclear Physics, in which they've trapped ultra cold nu neutrons. So, neutrons that have been uh, subjected to very, very cold temperatures in what are considered uh, magnetic bottles. They're they're not. It's not a real bottle per se, but it's the same uh, same idea as if you could trap a fly in a soda in a in a soda pop bottle. Um, this in this particular case, they're taking um, a conceptual bottle created through physics fundam fundamental fundamental physics properties and trapping these super cold, ultra cold neutrons. Um, so ultra-cold ultra -cold neutrons move very slowly. So if you uh, know uh, the idea of thermodynamics, um, matter speeds up as it gets warmer. And so when you uh, talk about uh, phase changes between different states of matter, you can think of maybe water as an example. Super cold water doesn't move. The atoms that make up water don't move very much. And so they get... Uh, they, they stay in a lattice-like formation and uh, they create ice. Um, the faster the atoms start vibrating, the components of the atoms start moving, um, the more the bonds break. And so then you end up with liquid water. The more the bonds break, the more you, uh, you, the more you heat up liquid water. Eventually you have the bonds breaking even more and water escaping into the atmosphere as gas. And so it all has to do with, with heat and how quickly things move. So if you take a neutron, just this, the, uh, the neutral component of the nucleus of an atom, and you cool it, cool it, cool it, cool it, it starts moving very slowly. And so you can use a magnetic field, a really strong magnetic field, to trap that slow-moving ultra-cold neutron. Um, so neutrons decay as uh, a lot of uh, as as matter tends to do uh, neutrons decay by beta emission and this can be measured and the uh, the the radiated energetic particles that are emitted during this decay process can be measured um, and they can be measured as the particles hit the edge of this magnetic bottle and, and 
scientists can get an idea of the date, the decay rate. And so according to this archive article, in the case of an ideal bottle, the decay rate should be equal, the rate of decay should be equal to the beta decay rate. But we don't live in an ideal world, so the rate of decay is always faster than the beta decay rate. And so they say there might be a third process at work that we could possibly uh, figure out uh, and actually measure. This third process might be neutrons jumping out of our universe and into another one. So maybe not even decaying. So the, the, the amount of neutron in the center of the bottle is disappearing faster than this beta emission rate. So if it's disappearing faster, where are the where's that material going? Are they jumping out of this universe into another universe? And so they think that we can potentially measure it. Um, yeah, one idea that they've proposed is to carry out a neutron trapping experiment that lasts during one orbit of the Earth around the sun. So uh, a year-long experiment in which the neutrons are exposed to this varying gravitational potential of our sun and the Earth uh, as the Earth travels around it. And so the changes in gravitational potential should actually influence the rate at which matter gets swapped because the change in gravitational potential is going to affect uh, the magnetic uh, the the magnetic field. It's going to affect uh, the how matter could maybe jump between universes. Not that this matter jumping happens on a uh, on a regular basis. It's actually a pretty rare event. But at the same time, I don't know anybody up for an experiment <clears throat> it's something that could potentially change everything it's pretty awesome whoa right whoa what it, well it depends yeah i mean i want to know what it finds when it gets there what's in that other universe i know it- can you actually send a neutron to it well we first we have to find out if they go to other universes and then we have to try and like attach some kind of spying mechanism to them okay neutron carry this little transceiver report back exactly yeah well yeah the other thing too is that in this experiment the the fact that something disappears right and then we can't measure where it's all its little bits have gone um might be a leap to say it's going to another universe might be it might be more practical to still stick to our one universe and say there's bits of this thing that we don't know how to detect <laughs> or mm-hmm. see or uh, right. so so but, but hey, regardless either you know either way the experiment is is very fascinating yeah, i still like i still like the one universe i don't want other universes i'm just <laughs> this one's big enough we got to just uh, but this is what happens you know like it was like the disclaimer for the day there was we started 100 years ago the universe was the Milky Way. That's all we knew of it. And then, you know, some more galaxies showed up and then some more and then billions upon billions of them. And then uh, even that today's estimates may be very low how big the universe is. So, uh, you yeah, uh, know, multi-universes at this point, why not? <laughs> just, just, <laughs> yeah, why not? Just by all my... My perspective of being a human being and how important that is in the universe has already been diminished by the size of the universe. It, it can't get much more humbling than it already is. <laughs> right. Uh, Gold Zader in the chat room is asking, can we detect neutrons arriving in our universe from others? And I think that's a really important question. Um, not that it can be detected, but uh, you'd think that if we have uh, neutrons in a bottle that are decaying or disappearing um, at a rate faster than we're measuring the decay rate by by beta emissions, um, you'd also maybe have situations if they're appearing in our universe that if you have a bottle of sorts that uh, you'd have a growth rate as opposed to a decay rate i mean yeah i don't i don't know exactly how you'd figure that out but um i think that would be an interesting question as as well because if if this is possible if neutrons can jump from our universe to an 
a parallel brain world, um, mm. could neutrons jump back? Yeah. And then we get into the most recent episode of Fringe. No. <laughs> no. Well, then the thing is, too, no, that's a very fascinating idea because if they can jump back, mm -hmm. there's this parallel universe. We got to understand what is the state of the parallel universe? Is it has it big banged along with our big bang, or is it completely a separate thing where our the matter and the things moving around our universe aren't the same? In which case, what happens if you ping into a uh, for lack of a better word, ping it over into a uh, a universe that hasn't had a Big Bang, that isn't formed, it is otherwise pretty much empty space. Like, what happens if it's the only bit of matter over there? Mm. Or it's just made up of of bits that have uh, slipped out of, uh, have, uh, out of our universe and over to there. What does that do to that other universe? Does that create a Big Bang or that little bangs or... Coalesce the, the something the, the little <laughs> particles over funny. Like what's even over there? If then if there's no space, then what was how does it it's all in the same place? And then do they just gather up and gather up and gather up until then there's a big bang? Is that what happens with a big bang? It's leakage from one brain to another. But uh eh, you never know. Ah, I you know, I, I just think, yeah, this this uh this article, this 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 theoretical idea is uh, it's just it's a great conversation starter it's a big it's a big what if and i i love that and if they can actually design experiments and in a year we could see results that would be pretty awesome too right but for for the social context it's a great conversation starter um to 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 discover if you're hanging out with the right people <laughs> because because if that conversation yeah, starter true. goes goes nowhere you need to hang with different friends. You need different people around you. Because that it very, should start a conversation. It, it should doesn't. start you a gotta conversation. Look, look, look around you. If it didn't start a conversation, get new friends. <laughs> new friends, really. This should be like a litmus test right here. Uh, right. Hello, universes, the family that did nothing, huh? Uh -huh. we're back to uh we're back to talking about television shows, are we? Okay. Well, you know, it's getting late. I'm looking at my I haven't had a wristwatch in over a decade, but I'm still looking there because denied with my trainings. Hey, uh, the Trojan horse. Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? Uh, uh, yes. Well, Helen of Troy, Trojan. Exactly. War, exactly. Right? A strategic maneuver. Okay. That was so brilliantly constructed, whether it actually happened or not, that it has gone throughout thousands and thousands of years as being known as the clever, strategic, brilliant action, the Trojan horse. Doesn't need much more explanation. You know what people are talking about. MIT researchers have discovered that uh, humans may not be and may not have invented the Trojan horse maneuver. And in fact, it may have, uh, it may have uh, predated us by quite some time. They discovered that some ocean bacteria should be aware of viruses bearing gifts. Well, not just the Greeks you need to be worried about anymore, but viruses too. Uh, <laughs> these viruses, they're referring to these viruses as uh, basically con artists that are carrying genetic material taken from previous bacterial hosts that trick the new host into using its own machinery to activate the genes. Uh, this is a process that has never been before documented in a virus bacteria relationship. So the Trojan horse. Uh, uh, operation happens like this. The, <laughs> the virus injects its DNA into a bacterium living in a phosphorus-starved region of the ocean. These bacteria are stressed by this lack of phosphorus. This is uh, the, a bacteria that uses phosphorus as a nu nutrient. Uh, they have their phosphorus-gathering machinery in high gear trying to accumulate as much of it as possible in order to survive. The, this is... Uh, the virus senses, now this is the part that doesn't get explained here, um, and I would like to learn more about this, but it, uh, it says the virus senses the host's stress and offers a helping hand, which is very odd because neither bacteria nor viruses have hands. So it's like a, it's a very <laughs> awkward. <laughs> well, the virus... Uh, the metaphor. Virus, uh, it's metaphorical. A metaphorical one. It probably isn't literal. I, I, 
Yeah. You know, I sometimes don't know when I'm reading these scientific documents how much is literal and when they're using an analogy because it's, it's very confusing. So the virus actually is offering uh, bacteria genes nearly identical to the host's own that enable it to gather still more phosphorus from its environment. So it's like you're working with three shovels. I've got another shovel to offer you. So, of course, you use it. Uh, what ends up actually happening you know, the bacteria says, thank you very much. Yes, I will use this. But the additional phosphorus that's being uh, gained by the new genes goes primarily to the virus, supporting its own repli replication of DNA. So once this process is complete, uh, it takes about 10 hours after infection, the virus finally says, you're welcome, by exploding its bacterial host, releasing many baby viruses back into the ocean where they can invade other bacteria, repeat the process, cycle of life. You're welcome. Additional now you yeah. die. <laughs> <laughs> the additional phosphorus gathering genes provided by the virus keep its reproduction cycle uh, on schedule here. In essence, the virus or phage is co-opting a very sophisticated component of the host's regulatory machinery to enhance its own reproduction something never before documented in a virus-bacteria relationship. We've seen this uh, certainly in more advanced uh, life forms that have used other, uh, sort of taken over machinery of other, I mean, bacteria does that in a sense of becoming, uh, taking over a host. So can, uh, well, we've seen lots of like the zombie crickets, uh, the, uh, there's, this has happened to bees, this has happened to a lot of different, organisms. But this is at the basis of uh, virus versus bacteria, never before seen. This is the first demonstration of a virus of any kind, even those heavily studying biomedical research, exploiting this kind of regulatory machinery in a host cell. It has evolved in response to extreme selection pressures of phosphorus limitation in many parts of the global ocean, says Sally W. Chisholm, a uh, professor of civil engineering Civil Environmental Engineering and Biology at MIT, Principal Investigator of Research. Uh, this is actually going to be, if you're looking for this, you can find this paper published in the January 24th issue of Current Biology. Phage have evolved the capability to sense, there's that word again. The phage have evolved the capability to sense the degree of phosphorus stressed, stress in the host they're infecting and have captured. Over evolutionary time, some components of the bacteria's machinery to overcome the limitation. That is, I mean, that's just, that's such a, a wild, wild situation. Well, every, um, every, when, when you, when you're concerned, when you raise a concern about the idea of a bacterium or a virus sensing something, um, sensation, I mean, we have a cognitive awareness of things that we can think about our senses, but everything is really a very physical effect. And in bacteria, it is as well. So uh, when we smell, it's a chemical linking, a chemical actually getting picked up by a receptor in uh, in neurons in our nose, in cells in our nose. So, um, you know, you have a receptor that binds to a particular chemical and then that sends a message to the brain and then we as humans can go, aha, that smells like roses. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. But a bacterium is going to have a very similar thing where if there's a chemical in the environment, it'll connect to something on the outside a receptor on the outside of the cell, or it'll be internalized into the bacterium, and uh, it will cause a signaling cascade of events, right. like a, um, a mouse trap. You know, one of what are the the mouse trap thingies? I mean, like when you drop the ping pong ball onto yes. all the loaded mouse traps, and they. No, so not rad. like that. Oh, <laughs> like I still think you... that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Rube Goldberg machine, a Rube Goldberg machine Lots. where it, um, it'll it start a sequence of events that once started, you can't really stop and keep going. And so in effect, you know, the the what it ends up doing is the bacterium senses that there might be a chemical gradient or the virus, a virus could do a, a potential. And, that, and that was the part that, 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 that blew me away is that they're talking about this in terms of a virus. Because I, I guess it's still... Yeah. Yeah, I still, I mean, I, I, bacteria is like a, a still living organism. 
Right. The virus is not supposed to be alive. Virus isn't it's supposed still, to be a living organism, and it's sensing things. It's still chemi- chemically motivated. Yeah. It's, but, you know, anything that can be chemically motivated um, can potent, or not even chemically, maybe uh, UV light could could motivate um, a, a virus for a particular reason. But if there is a chain of molecular events that can be set in motion, then it will be set in motion by the right stimulus. And in this yeah. case, the right stimulus is is an opportune moment in which uh, to infect a bacteria. You know, I mean, right. this is uh, this is over uh, you know some billions of years of evolution in the oceans. This they've they've evolved together over time. Um, yeah, but this is. Uh, this is oh, fascinating. It, it, I love this it. This is very fascinating. Ch- 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 uh, Chisholm kind of ends this here with saying, the environment of the human body is dramatically different from that of the open oceans. And these oceanic fish have much to teach us about fundamental biological processes. Yeah. Come to, we've come to think of this whole system as a bit of, another bit of evidence for the incredible intimacy of the relationship of phage and host. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. You know, and it's hard to, yeah. This, uh, I, I, I've, I've always had the argument, uh, we've talked about this before too, where there always seems to be some, some element of genetic learning to be able to adapt because there's so many predator and prey rela- relationships that, that seem to have adapted to each other in ways that are so specific, um, whether it's through camouflage uh, a, a, a squirrel that's common prey of rattlesnakes being able to move its tail back and forth and look larger than it actually is. I mean, there, there's just so many examples of uh, of these things. This is a very specific one between a virus and a bacteria that you natural selection alone can't account for it. Some sort of genetic trickery uh, on this scale almost seems like in something like this that they would have had to, for, to be able to pick up the same proteins that do the f- process of phosphorus, which it doesn't use itself, but needs the host to do it. You would almost think they would have to have spent a good amount of time together. Uh, almost, there may have been even some point when they were codependent. I don't know. Like, it, it just opens up a bunch of fascinating questions about how something like this can develop evolutionarily. Yep, I absolutely agree. <sighs> I think it's time for, for our update from Zooland. <laughs> <laughs> our, yeah. our resident Zoolander? Oh. oh, Yeah, our resident Zoolander. Sorry, I've got pictures falling over <laughs> on my desk. Resident Zoolander, intern Blair. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Was that Blue Steel? Blue Steel. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so today I, f- I found an article about bower birds and they're these really cool kind of architect birds that they designed this whole what i would call a stage to woo their woman (laughs) and so these great bower birds in australia they have all the different types of bower birds do different types of bowers and there's there's these tall uh, towers on either side and then there's an avenue in the middle and they arrange all sorts of stone shells whatever they can find on that avenue. And they found that these guys, the great bower birds, were arranging them from smallest stones in the front to the largest in the back. <laughs> and there's some theories about that, but they actually found a really good correlation. It was an R squared of 0.96. So that's, a that's really, really one being perfect. Right. So it's mm-hmm. a really intense almost perfect correlation between mating success and how smooth the gradient from small to large was in the avenue of the bower. (laughs) And so they were saying that it's probably related to optical illusions because, as we all know, when there's big things but they're far away, they look smaller. Mm -hmm. So it makes all of the stones from the front, the smallest, and the back are the biggest. They make them all look the same size. And the male is all the way at the back where the large stones are and the females in the front. So really, it sounds like it would make him look smaller. It does. But they do this 
long dance and they'll pick up stones and play with them and the dance will go from one to 12 minutes. So if he's in the back looking small, picking up stones, mm -hmm. then he must be really strong. Right. He's really <laughs> strong. Also, he looks smaller. So apparently the bowers, they're, they all look different, but they're all open ended. So there's two ends to it. And they found that if there was an enclosed bower, the female wouldn't even go in because she would think she would be trapped and she couldn't get away. So I don't know if also they look less intimidating, less scary to her. They even said also in there that it, they might be doing it just to confuse her and kind of daze her because when she, when they're <laughs> that's, done... That's the best tactic. Leave yeah. the girl dazed and confused. <laughs> when, when they're done, they just kind of run around back real quick and mate. So I don't know... If they're just trying to get their, her confused and dazed enough, long enough to just sneak in there. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> those, are those simple minded, <laughs> evil minded uh, female bower birds. Yeah. <laughs> they just can't take it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think I think that idea that they would be overwhelming <laughs> the female with their activity is I think that's a stretch. Yeah. I mean, like Unless it's some kind of bird hypnotism act, but at the it just makes me think. I mean, there's so much going on in the environment at all times that a bird yeah. needs to be aware of. That kind of um, a result is really not something that you would expect. Yeah, that, no, that's I, a little... I, I agree. It's it seems like that they would be too easily confused, and they'd never have any successful chicks ever, ever, <laughs> ever. Yeah. yeah, I don't know about that one. Yeah, but it makes yeah. sense that maybe it does make him look strong. Yeah. Because the stone is a lot bigger compared to him, his body size. That sounds pretty good. I like that. I, I, th <laughs> I think, I, I, think I, I should have written that study. You should have. No. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny, too, because they said that the bower birds, the males, will actually sneak over to other males' bowers and mess them up. And then the uh, those bower birds will s stay up all night fixing their bower very meticulously. And so some of the scientists went in and they would either reverse the gradient or they would kind of just mix it all up and the bower birds would go back and fix it right away. <laughs> I think bower birds are fascinating. <laughs> Building their special environment, their stage with which to woo. You know, and different bower birds have different uh, routines. And so you have uh, satin bower birds that like to use the color blue right. in their bowers that they create. Um, they're, and then these birds that are creating this depth perception mm -hmm. kind of trick of the eye. It's just fascinating. What, and like Justin, that's you a, were saying- That's a tough color though. That's uh, blue is hard to find in nature. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a, fine. So if you find it, you must be pretty awesome. Exactly. That's the good stuff. I got blue. <laughs> Check me out. It's red. It's so interesting that so much energy goes into things that have nothing to do directly with survival in mm -hmm. a lot of animals that you put so much energy into sexu sexual selection pressure that, I mean, it's like, it suddenly it becomes too. But. Yeah, it suddenly <laughs> becomes artificial. Yeah. So, it, yeah, suddenly there's this separation <laughs> yeah wait wait a second what becomes artificial artificial well going from um just what what you see is what you get and just saying okay you're a good looking bird let's have let's mate oh yeah no i i'm i'm Look, all for that all i wish i mean all of that would get rid of dinner in a movie speeches. if we went you're around yeah. yeah and you we're, have we don't have all this pretense <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought this is what women always wanted was like the whole like take me out, take me to a nice place. You know, let's not just make it completely about sex. Let's but if yeah, no, I'm I'm in full agreement. We could just make it all about <clears throat> sex. <laughs> and on that note, I think it's time <laughs> right that we back. head to the bridge. We'll go <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go up on the bridge and look over for a minute. We'll yeah. see you back here in just a few minutes. This is This Week in Science. Stay tuned. Shows the way to go. 
This hour of twists is brought to you by audible.com and audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 different titles in their library and you can get one of those titles for free. That's right. You can get a free audiobook download. And I think you can find some great science books in their library. I know Twist has found some wonderful science books in the last few years in the Audible library. All you have to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's right. Go right now to audiblepodcast.com slash twist for your free audiobook download. And while we're thinking about books, let's talk a moment about Twist Book Club. Twist Book Club is reading Fool Me Twice by Sean Lawrence Otto this month. It's book of the month for January. It's a science, a book on science and politics and the science of politics and how politics is getting involved in science. And oh my. Anyway, we're going to be talking with Sean Otto next Thursday on This Week in Science, talking about the book. So if you're reading along or if you haven't been reading along, jump on in. Read with us so that you know what we're talking about when we talk with him next Thursday. That's right. Fool Me Twice by Sean Lawrence Otto. And finally, Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, and lots of fun things that we try and do for this show. We appreciate any amount that you can give. $2, $2 million, whatever you feel up to, you make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal and have made the process easy by putting donation buttons on each of our show pages, uh, the episode pages at twist.org, our website. So go to twist.org, check out the most recent episode, take a listen, maybe comment on some things that you hear and say what you think within the community, and then click on the donation button and uh, make a donation. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. Kirsten, That's what do you got? I've got another story. You know I do. Bonobo, tame thyself. Oh, yeah. And we know how they did it, too. Yeah, you know, we were talking a little bit about sex in the uh, before we went to the break. Not really. But anyway, bonobos are... Uh, relatives are the are cousins to humans, humankind, closest living relative to the chimpanzee. Um, it's thought that bonobos and chimpanzees split some time ago, and it's a, been a question as to what exact, exactly led to this split uh, in the two species and why bonobos seem to be so different from their chimpanzee cousins. So, Bonobos um, can be aggressive, just like chimps. However, they're usually not. They're usually very peaceful animals. Chimpanzees are known to be pretty violent, aggressive, and have a very uh, dynamic, hierarchical uh, uh, communities. Um, Bonobos... Uh, have been touted as being the loving ape, where uh, where they have a lot more fun. They play a lot more often, and they have a lot more sex. Bow, chicka, bow, bow. But they don't really get the music. But anyway, <laughs> chimpanzees are also more uh, more. They eat a lot more meat in their diet. They hunt in packs, and have uh, it's been been shown they eat on they 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 will eat um, smaller primates that they can catch uh, and many other species of animals. Bonobos are mostly vegetarian. 
They don't, they do eat meat. They can eat meat, but they don't really eat a lot of it. They're mostly vegetarian, eating a lot of the, uh, the veggies, the vegetable matter that is found in their environment. And so, um, there's a recent paper that's out by anthropologist Brian Hare of Duke University's Institute for Brain Sciences. And he has this, uh, he's written a paper that is fascinating. And Justin, you'll be interested in this because the way he came upon his idea of how bonobos diverged is... Um, he saw a presentation on bonobos by a different uh, sci scientist, Harvard University anthropologist Richard Rangham. And uh, Richard Rangham was talking about uh, the traits, of the niceness of bonobos, how peaceable they are compared to chimpanzees, and how they had uh, some very slight body differences. They're a little smaller, leaner uh, than chimpanzees, uh, smaller skulls, shorter canine teeth, um, so there, there are these characteristics that separate it that seem to be part of a constellation of characteristics that are known as the domestication syndrome. And Brian Hare thought about the Trut Foxes study, which is a, a study in which Russian geneticist took wild silver foxes and then took the nicest ones within that silver fox population the ones that were snarling together. at him the least <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, they would go out there foxes that were all snarling aggressive you're not in the ones that uh initially were just less aggressive um would then be selected for breeding the next round of breeding and then they would do the same thing that group of puppies some were a little snarly some would actually be able to uh, you'd be able to walk up to rather closely before they would snarl so you pick the the most passive amongst that group you make another uh, generation. And then it got to the point, yeah, where at the end they had basically fully domesticated uh, silver foxes, although they no longer looked like the original silver fox. They began to take on characteristics that we're much more familiar with. They stayed uh, floppy eared and puppy like a lot longer. Their hair became a lot longer. There were coloration differences in the fur that weren't mm -hmm. present in the original population. Canines, not so sharp. <laughs> Very slight differences. Uh, so, I mean, not just slight differences, but mm -hmm. definite differences between the, uh, them and the original population within about 20 generations. So it occurred in a very short period of time. Um, the this, uh, this researcher, Hare, has suggested that there could have been some kind of environmental separation or for some reason, one population, one little group of chimpanzees maybe got separated from other chimpanzees. They, where chimpanzees live in an environment that they have to compete a lot for food um, that might have led to their aggressive tendencies. Uh, bonobos are in an area where they really have no other competition for their food source. They're pretty much, you know, they have as much as they want to eat, so they didn't have to fight. So maybe over time, um, in within their community, it was better for the community for the nicer individuals to to mate together. And so maybe uh, it was that's, a that's a sequence of events that basically self tamed bonobos were chimpanzees that tamed themselves is what but it likely it likely suggested. wasn't natural selection and this is where we may disagree on this but this is this was the whole point of the that the, the fox study which was they they eventually isolated what they think was happening different um the less passive males because certainly they were doing selection to begin with to get their their starting group um which could have been uh, but, but it can happen through competition too, and the reason is there's less stress hormone uh, when the when the ba the baby foxes are in utero if there is a less stressed mother if they're calmer it, to begin with. And we know this, and, and, and it's actually been shown parallel, in humans as well. Mm -hmm. Correct. And the parallel to this is if you're in an area that doesn't have competition, where there isn't as much natural um, stresses in the environment. Even, even if you weren't pre-selected for your demeanor over generations, 
you, there would be less stress in the environment, therefore less stress for the mother while these hormones are going in. So the development takes place a little bit different of, of the just, child. So I just, co I just, I'm sorry to, tan to take this on a tangent, mm -hmm. but I just totally just hit on an idea. You know, there's an increase in the number of, um, of post-college students not looking at you, Blair, <laughs> who tend to stay at home for uh, for an extended period of time. And there have been articles written about um, people, humans, having this extended childhood. Mm. We live in a period now that of, of relatively less stress than we used to. Are yeah. humans going through some mm. kind of a dom further domestication process? <laughs> Yeah, supposedly men's hips are widening, like not just uh, not just our belt lines, but uh, our actual physical hips. There have been lots of theories to this. Some had pointed at some point to the use of plastics as uh, synthetic estrogens getting in, uh, or or it could be yeah, it could be less competitive lifestyles. I don't, but I don't know though. I, I also wonder if if the business world or the job world, the working world, is enough to simulate um, the stresses of the. Of the jungle, or of you know the community, it may, they and, may and be you worse. Know what? <laughs> they, the working <laughs> world, it's it's enough yeah, to just try and may, you, know. you know. I, I mean, I, with the seventy-hour work week, it may uh, try may not seem to join a little it too for as long as you can. <laughs> you never know. Try not to join it. That's all I can say. Yeah, my, my my speculation though is that the environment is is the uh, mechanism, the catalyst for the selection itself. Um, this has always been also my uh, idea. Of, why why there's so many white furred animals in the arctic it may not simply be the selection um but the, that's one of the things they noticed in the foxes as the more domestic they got the lighter tones they were getting in the fur um because that's also they can isolate when that happens based on hormones from the mother so if they were in a more relaxed environment where there weren't predators uh everywhere because it's a le lot less populated in the arctic you know that the, that may have been one of the catalysts for the different apparent appearance, which then lends itself to, you know, the environment overall uh, as well, because of course it would be better to hide than that. So, but with the bonobos, it seems like it could be a combination. It, you get the right group that splinters off. You have yeah. no competition, so there's less of the stressful hormones taking place uh, pre-birth. And you end up with a, a completely different, uh, completely different society. Completely different. And to the point where it's a, you know, what they consider a completely different species. It's pretty interesting. Bonobos. It's an enigma wrapped mm -hmm. in a riddle or riddle wrapped in an enigma. Right. Justin, what did you bring? What else do you have so to talk about? I've got, I've got another, uh, I've got another story here, but actually I kind of want to talk about one I don't have ready yet, so I'll wait on that one. Uh, scientists have created the shortest, purest X-ray laser pulses ever achieved, fulfilling a 45-year-old prediction, ultimately opening the door to new medicines, devices, and materials. The researchers, reporting in the uh, current nature, aimed radiation from the LINAC coherent light source, located at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, at a cell containing neon gas setting off an avalanche of X-ray emissions to create something very cool indeed, an atomic X-ray laser. I think, I think they sold, like, handguns of those, like, in the backs of comic books when I was growing up. Atomic X-ray laser. X-ray, uh, X-rays give us penetrating views into the world of atoms and molecules, says physicist Nina Rochringer, a group leader at Max Planck Society's Advanced Study Group. The new laser fulfills the 1967 prediction, which proposed that X-ray lasers could be made by first removing inner electrons from atoms and then inducing electrons to fall from higher to lower energy levels, releasing a single color of light in the process. But until 2009, when they turned on the uh, LANIC coherent light source, uh, there was no way, uh, no X-ray sources were powerful enough to create this type of laser. To make the atomic X-ray laser, the powerful X-ray pulses from LCLS each a billion. These pulses knocked electrons out of the inner shells of many of the neon atoms. When the other electron, electrons fell into the holes, 
about one in 50 atoms responded by emitting a hard X-ray, which is a very short wavelength. Those X-rays then stimulated neighboring neon atoms to emit more X-rays, creating a domino effect that amplified the laser light 200 million times. Wow, that's a powerful atomic X-ray laser. Yeah. This work represents a big advance in the quest for shorter wavelength lasers. Uh, Livermore scientists included, uh, 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 scientist Rich London said, in addition, the demonstration of the neon X-ray laser proves a very sensitive test of the physics of intense X-ray interaction with atoms. By comparing theoretical models to the observed output signals, one can pin down the basic ultra-fast process occurring in the region where the beam interacts with the gas. So this is going to be pretty, uh, pretty wild stuff going forward, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds fascinating. There's an, another study that's out through uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, uh, the SLAC Laboratory, um, which is where LINAC, where the LINAC is, and where they've done this atomic X-ray stuff, where they've um, heated matter to two million degrees using a laser. So it's um, in doing so, they can look at, uh, they can start to investigate matter at this very, very high temperature and what happens at this these temperatures. Uh, and being able to do this and what they've done. So I've been talking a lot over the last couple of years about the National Ignition Facility, where they are using this really complicated setup that's basically like the length of a football field long to take a laser and pointed at this really, really, really tiny atomic you know, atomic scale target that they're trying to hit to create nuclear fusion. Um, and th- it's this huge building and the, all these mirrors and all these things. And it, they, they have to, they've been spending the last few years fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning. Like it's taking on the matter of years to fine tune their laser to the point where they can actually hit the target well enough to create fusion. Um, But uh, what they've done at Stanford in in this Palo Alto laboratory facility is create a, a much simpler laser setup that can potentially bring a matter two atoms maybe uh, or atoms of deuterium and um, tritium to a temperature at which they could fuse and create nuclear fusion without the giant building and all of the stuff necessary. So um, if the, the very exciting stuff, if NIF can actually show that they can produce an energy positive laser ignited fusion event, then potentially they could take what they're doing over at at SLAC, the Stanford laser, put the two together, and then you have a miniaturized setup where um, you don't need as much space. It's much easier to do. You can set it up in less time. And suddenly you have nuclear fusion power plants. It's so exciting. Where did Justin go? Sorry, I hit the button. With the energy uh, crisis <laughs> then permanently solved, we can move on to bigger and better conflicts. Right. <laughs> bigger and better conflicts. Like how to use black holes to power our future super civilization. Mm. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, we could do that. So there, sort there are babes. researchers trying to figure that out. <laughs> Uh, this is this is an interesting story that's going to lead to another future prediction by me. This is uh, yes. they are looking at uh, the intersection. What is today Russia, Mongolia, China, Kazakhstan region known as the Altai key area because it is the place where people have been coming and going for many thousands of years, says Theodore Shore, associate pre- uh, professor at Penn's Department of Anthropology. Shore, together with Doctoral student Matthew Dulick, a team of graduate students and postdoctoral researchers, collaborated on a work basically investigating some of the genes of folks and trying to do some tracking of who exactly became the Native Americans. So some of the predecessors uh, were the first Native Americans. Some twenty to 25,000 years ago, these prehistoric humans carried their Asian genetic lineages up to the far reaches of Siberia and then eventually crossed across the then-exposed Bering landmass to the Americas, 
as goes the the prevailing theory of of how the Americas got populated. And, it, and it's it's still one of those things that's a little bit um, unclear. Part of the problem is we're not allowed to investigate uh, most Native American sites or, or bones because they are the sovereign territory in the United States and don't allow a whole lot of research to be done. But there are there are sites in, in the Americas we know that are thirteen thousand plus years years back. Some potentially even further back than that. Um, so this is showing a group twenty to twenty five thousand years ago. The team study published the American Journal of Human Genetics analyzed genetics of individuals living in Russia's Altai Republic to identify markers that might link them to Native Americans. They've done other prior ethnographic studies, or others have done ethnographic studies that have found distinctions between tribes in northern and southern Altai. So this is, uh, they're looking sort of at the, um, the population to the, I think the north on this one. Uh, so basically they were using mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited and white chromosome DNA, which is passed from fathers to sons. They completed the sample, uh, com uh, compared the samples to ones previously collected by individuals in southern Siberia, Central Asia, Mongolia, East Asia, very, and a variety of American indigenous groups. So it's a, it's a pretty wide-ranging study. Calculating how long the mutations took note in some of these, they estimate that the southern Alatian uh, lineage diverged genetically from the Native American lineage 13 to 14,000 years ago, <clears throat> which, which diverged is kind of tough 13 to 14,000 years ago if there are already people here. And I guess that sort of, sort of makes sense, but there could be another scenario in here. Uh, it aligns the idea with them going though, yeah, fifteen to twenty thousand years ago, heading into the Americas. So I guess that actually the timing of that would be about right. Though it's possible, even likely, that more than one wave of people crossed the land bridge. Sure said that the other researchers have not yet been able to identify a similar geographic focal point from which Native Americans can trace their heritage, which is kind of interesting because I was pretty sure I'd read a study not too long ago that was linking um, genetic elements of Southern Asia. Which is this is very this is like uh, sort of Siberian region almost here, yeah. right? And so, the, one of the things that kind of the, the um, there's a new group though. There's a new group out there. This is what I, this is the prediction part of this, because I've heard this other story that's that's heavily linking Southern Asia um, with with uh, partly it's, it's it's a convoluted thing because some of it is. Uh, they're going uh, off of like language things that seem to possibly be related, you know, le less genetic evidence. But here's my prediction. I'm going to predict that they're going to find linkages to the Siberian group here that they're discussing. And as well as the, the, the South uh, Southern Asian uh, links, they're going to find things in common between the two that seem to have been genetic drift from those populations. Maybe something else, though. Uh, what I'm thinking of, of is the Denisova people. Right. The Denisova other group. Right. So this group. is the group. This was the group that uh, they, they, they're supposedly pretty much died out uh, some 40,000 years ago. Um, not quite maybe that long ago, actually. But uh, sort of like Neanderthal. It's a different species of humans that was coexisting at times when, when we were living in the area. They happened to populate uh, Southern Asia and a Siberian region. They sort of had split off along <laughs> that, that east coast of, of Russia. So it'd be really fascinated to find that, uh, that going forward, the Native American populations uh, have a good amount of Denisova, Denisovia. How do you say that word again? De Denisova? Denisovian? I'm not even sure what to call it. Denisova hominins. <laughs> I'd be very, I'd be very curious to find out if uh, we get a good genetic makeup of Denisova. Compare that to Native American markers. My guesstimate, my prediction is that we'll find a good link there. It's very possible. That could be interesting. Yeah. We'll wait for it. We'll wait for that link. Um, so, uh, last couple of stories for for the show: um, social psychology and fMRI. Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Uh, researchers at Emory University have been looking at 
people's personal values and what kind of a value uh, you're willing to put on those, uh, what kind of money value, dollar value you're willing to put on your values uh, and when you will sell out and how your brain decides whether or not to sell out. Um, what they uh, have published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society is that if you have a very, very strong belief, uh, there's it's like a, or a code of ethics or what they say, if something is in the realm of the sacred, whether it's a strong religious belief, a national identity, or a code of ethics, it's a distinct cognitive process from other decision-making uh, processes. So uh, when you come up in a situation where you have to make a decision, uh, often you will do a cost your brain, whether or not it's with your knowledge, your brain is doing a cost benefit analysis. How much, how much are you going to gain? How much are you going to lose? And you can do this co uh, consciously or unconsciously, but uh, there's often a cost benefit analysis that goes on. However, if it's this one of these sacred beliefs, then it's uh, judged on its own. It's a separate process. And there's a set of rules, right or wrong. So basically, uh, if something is sacred, you the more sacred it is, the less willing you are to sell out, to be able to take money um, for selling out your belief. The researchers got a uh, recorded the brain responses of 32 adults during an experiment in which they were shown statements ranging from mundane statements like, you are a tea drinker, to something like, you support gay marriage, you are pro-life. So, um, uh, there were con contradictory statements as well, such as you are pro-choice and the participants had to choose one of the one of each pair and their brains were being measured at the, at the whole time. Additionally, um, they were given the option of auctioning their personal statements. So I said this, this is what I stated, but if I want to take it back, I'll take some money for it. So um, they could earn as much as $100 per statement. And this is real money they offered the, the study participants. Um, they could earn as much as $100 per statement by signing an agreement and uh, signing a document stating the opposite of what they believed. So uh, they could sell out and say, so if they were pro-choice, they could sign a document and say, with signing their name, I am pro-life, but make up to $100. But they had to put a dollar amount on it to do it. Um, anyway, they found that in cases, only in cases where participants refused to take cash to state the opposite of what they believe, those statements represented the most repugnant item, items to the individual. And um, that was the when they would see arousal in the amygdala region, a brain region associated with emotional reactions. Um, so if basically your sacred, what you hold sacred and to, to be true is violated, it actually, um, it stimulates a, an emotional disgust response from your mm. brain. Um, it, it induces what they call moral outrage. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the, the researchers say as culture changes, it affects our brains. As our brains change, that affects our culture and you can't separate the two. We now have the means to start understanding this relationship and that's putting the relatively new field of cultural neuroscience onto the global stage. Additionally, they go on to say that um, uh, within this is the idea of uh, of of how groups and group think might affect our moral beliefs and so uh, often you go to church you're part of a an organized religion that will affect what you hold sacred and the beliefs that you have um, and so they suggest that uh, that groups might be a mechanism within our culture to transmit and instill 
rules, moral rules. Um, and the researcher suggests that it stands to reason that the more you involved you are with groups, the stronger those rules become. So there may also be uh, going from these personal beliefs and how willing you are to sell out. It might have something to do also with groups. And that ties into the last study I wanted to just briefly uh, blurb is one in which researchers at Virginia Tech Carilion Research Institute found that group settings actually can lower your IQ. Mm. <laughs> So I'm not going to say anything else here, but I'm just going to leave it to everyone out there to tie these two studies together on their own. <laughs> Does that be, is that because we all think we're much more brilliant when we're by ourselves and <laughs> not comparing ourselves to anything? Is that, is that what that means? I think, I think to the previous story, the first story there, though, um, I think it's a great mind that can hold two contradictory contrasting ideas in their mind at the same time. Mm. Uh, and and so anything else really becomes a form of sheep think um, where you're not you're not having the the argument of both sides playing out simultaneously in your own head, but have decided to just choose ones and by choice. Most people aren't choosing how they view or where their moral outrages are in the world. Those are things that were uh, trained into them. Uh, taught to them by parents or teachers or whoever, whatever the society they're in. Not to say that there isn't anything that should cause moral outrage in the world, but that, you know, that which we have chosen or, or are selecting as, a, as opposed to just debating in our heads is, you know, is conditioning and, and isn't, I don't, mm -hmm. I have a hard time even considering it thought. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, Socrates says uh, anything that the author says is already dead. Anything that they wrote down, eh, you know what? Sell them out. Sell out both ideas, though. Can I get a hundred dollars for both of them? You can have both of those ideas. You can, <laughs> you can, yeah, you, you can contradict. You can have. Can I give you both the pro life <laughs> and the and the thing, just so I don't have to hear about it anymore? Can I give both of them? And then people ask me, I'll be like, I have no opinion. I, I have no opinion. It's really I almost that you know. Away and I took money for it. I will just have no opinion on either side of that story. Give me $200. Yeah. I like it. I like it. We are at the end of the show. We made That's it. That's it. To the That's end. all we got? There's no more? Oh, oh, oh no. That means I got to wait another week to do another show. Yeah, one more week before the next twist drops. But in the meantime, there's a whole bunch of science out there. You can head over to Science with a Twist in Facebook to uh, take a look at stories that people from our community, our, our Twist Minion community, are posting. The on Twist the Minion page. Science Magazine of links yeah. to cool sciencey stories. There's some great stories and. Several stories that I talked about tonight happened. I to pulled come. one off of there. I pulled one out right off of there. Right off That's of there. Right. Boom. I don't feel bad about it. And in fact, I thank you. I thank you for sharing those stories and giving us fodder <laughs> for the week. On next week's show, we are going to be talking with Sean Lawrence Otto uh, in the second half of the show about his book, Fool Me Twice, which is the Twist Book Club book of the month. So I hope that you do join us. If you have any questions uh, or things that you would like to talk about, make sure and uh, hit me up. Let me know what you would like to know. And I'll see if I can ask him. Yeah, thank you everybody for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. You can simply Google us in the iTunes directory, This Week in Science, and we'll pop up there. Uh, we also have the Android device, if, in case you want to hear us on the go. Android device, look for Twist, the number four droid app in the Android marketplace. Twist number four droid. Uh, and uh, you can also just look at Twist in the marketplace for the iPhone thingy, which it should also be there. I don't have an i thing so I would know. <laughs> For more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website. Thanks to the lovely Blair who is helping with the show notes. Our website is twist.org and we want to hear from you. So please email us uh, if you're not post something on the website. You go to twist.org, look at the show notes, listen to the show, and post something. We want to hear from you in the comments section. You can also email us at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or justin at thisweekinscience.com. Be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line or your email will get spam filtered into oblivion. For uh, 
Uh, quicker contact, though, you can get a hold of us on Twitter, at, Jack, uh, at Jacksonfly or at Dr. Kiki. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And I'd like to thank the Twit engineers for engineering this show, Twit for making it possible. And we will be back here next week and hope that you'll join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember, it's all in your head. In science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got me Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. of items I want to address from stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought and I'll try to answer any question you've got but how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week this week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say and if you've learned anything This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, 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 this week in science.